This episode is a doozy. Stay tuned for terrifying creatures seen in the dark and one epic and disturbing demonic haunting that gave even me the chills. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails. And if you like what I do, go to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave Unexplained Encounters a rating. Thank you. Today, I've got an assortment of encounters with the unexplained featuring skinwalkers, demons, and mysterious creatures that can keep up with cars on nighttime drives. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your scariest true stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. You can also go to eeriecast.com for more scary podcasts, such as my other show, Tales from the Break Room. Now, let's begin. Peaceful Night Ends in Me Shooting a Skinwalker From Snowboy 382 I'm 27, and I have a background in public safety and private security. My family has a long history of dealing with the occult, too. On the English side of my family, I have a great aunt who was a black witch and necromancer. On top of that, I have a dozen or so Wiccans in the family. On my Cherokee side... I have a couple of long-deceased medicine men and shamans. This happened back in 2019 when I was 23. I live in Washington State, and at the time I lived near Mount St. Helens, known for Bigfoot sightings. I had a stressful day at work and just started my weekend, so I decided to indulge myself in some night driving through the woods. It's an activity I'd recently discovered, and I found it helped me clear my head. Due to my line of work, I'm always armed, and this time was no exception. As I drove deep into the woods, I came across a vehicle with its hazard lights on. I drove past, mostly to assess the situation. Now, I do admit I was a bit paranoid about this. I'd recently listened to a podcast about someone helping a stranded car and getting ambushed. After my first pass, I could see it was one man and no one else around. So I decided to stop and help. I let him hitch a ride with me, and after getting to a spot with cell service, we parted ways. I felt good about my good deed. I wanted to grab my friend Bill and drive around some more, so I turned around and started to make my way back to town. I came across a bridge I'd crossed many times before, but something felt different this time. While crossing the bridge, I noticed a hole in the chain link fence and a strange new sound. I stopped and got out to listen. The sound resembled something big and metallic, being dragged across concrete. And as I listened, I could faintly feel the bridge under my feet shift. Weirded out, I approached the hole in the fence, noticing that it looked like it had been ripped open from the outside of the bridge. Not like when someone is repairing a section and unhooking it. No, I mean it looked like something had stuck its hands through and ripped it into a circular hole. I continued to approach the fence, and pulled out my flashlight, streamlight for the win. Once I got to the hole, I leaned out to see into the ravine below. It was there I saw a large barrel-shaped traffic cone perfectly placed about 150 feet below. After staring at it for a couple of minutes, trying to understand why it was there, that's when it happened. The sound grew louder, then stopped abruptly. From the underside of the bridge, I saw a large white hand with what looked to be razor-sharp claws reach up and grab the side of the bridge, followed by another hand, then the head. The head of it was slim and long, with small black pin-like eyes similar to those of a shark. The mouth was a small horizontal slit that remained closed until it let out a hiss almost like a whisper. I could feel its breath on me. That's when reality set in, and I realized this wasn't just in my head. Out of pure reflex, I managed to put my flashlight back into its holster and draw my sidearm. I turned on the light on my weapon, streamlight again. I started to fire at the creature, and yet it kept climbing up the side of the bridge, completely unfazed. I backed up toward my car while it continued to approach. I emptied my second magazine when I reached the car. Just 12 feet away, I reloaded and peeled out of there. As I drove away from it, I saw it retreat back through the hole it had almost crawled through. 
The creature was somewhere between 10 to 13 feet tall, making me no match for it at all. On the drive back to town, I sat in my car in silence, replaying the event in my head over and over again. When I just started to drive away, I noticed I was only on the next song on my playlist. That would mean the encounter lasted roughly six minutes, but I'll tell you now, it felt like it lasted a lifetime. Once I was back in town, I grabbed a bigger gun and my friend Bill. When he got into the passenger seat, I told him the whole story. He was a believer in the supernatural like me, but he had never had any of his own real experiences to speak of. After I finished the tale, he seemed excited to see what this thing was and where it was. After an hour's drive, we made it back to the bridge, but the creature was gone. However, all along the bridge, my spent casing served as proof to him and a reminder for me. Fast forward five months, I had a girlfriend then named Nicole. I believe she was sensitive to the other side. One day it was Bill, Nicole, and I driving through the woods, heading towards the same bridge. I began to tell the story to Nicole, and she was intrigued. By this point, I'd learned about skinwalkers and the legends behind them. I thought that thing I saw was one of them. After all, the area around Mount St. Helens is steeped in native lore and legends. As we drew near the bridge, I saw Nicole starting to go pale. She began to shake as if the car was freezing. The closer we got, the worse she became. Interestingly, we never told her about the bridge or how far we were from it. As we crossed the bridge, Nicole almost had a meltdown. We also discovered something strange. Flowers woven into the fence around that hull. That's when I made a realization. The barrel. I told them I thought the barrel was there to mark where they found a body. A wave of sadness and relief washed over the car. While leaving and discussing it further, I proposed a theory. If these things can manipulate people, what if it lured someone there, and then that person got pulled through the hole? That peace we felt was then consumed by rage and even fear. It rocked us to our core. It felt as if we had angered the devil himself. The forest felt changed that night, becoming much less inviting and more dark and ominous. When we parted ways that night, Nicole drove home to Portland. It seemed like the creature had left a spiritual brand on her, which followed and affected her mental state for months to come. The Thing in the Woods From Kai the Fish In 2023, sometime in around late June, it was roughly about 9.30pm, when a friend of mine named Kay and I were driving through old Boonesboro, Missouri. I can't remember the vehicle we were in, but the thing was quite beat up. Still, it got us from point A to point B, so no complaints. Kay and I were listening to music, smoking up together. We were telling various stories of how we almost totaled our vehicles from crossing deer. The two of us were mid-conversation until something caught our eyes. We'd glanced over to my passenger window. Something big had been running alongside the car. Now, it was too dark to see. There had been no streetlights on this stretch of highway we were on. Kay, noticing he was swerving a bit, corrected the vehicle, while my eyes stayed glue on the creature alongside us. We were driving faster now, approximately a good 65 to 70 miles per hour, and yet somehow... This animal was still keeping up with the car. For size reference, the animal was about the same size as an elk. It was fairly large. Thanks to the darkness, there were no details we could see to pinpoint what the animal may be. But we definitely knew it was fast. Seconds began to feel like hours. I peeled my eyes from the animal for just a moment to see the road in front of us. Thankfully, there were no other cars on the road at the time. That was good considering we weren't really driving safe. I glanced back to see the animal lurch for the car suddenly. Kay must have seen it too, because he jumped and corrected the vehicle once more. When the animal lurched, 
It looked as if it was bucking on hind legs before it seemed to stand a few inches off the ground. I almost thought it would hit the car, but thankfully it quickly whipped around and dashed right into the woods alongside the road. Kay and I shared glances between us, making sure we both saw the same thing. We sat there for the rest of the drive, mostly in silence. But after a while, we attempted to pinpoint what it was, but we didn't come up with a solid explanation. To this day, I haven't spoken about it, or even asked about it. All I know was it was huge, with the body of a large deer, but it did not act like a deer. I've never seen a deer do that before anyway. I do know for sure that I will not be visiting Boonesboro anytime soon. Strange Occurrences at My Friend's Graduation Party From Snapping Thrag This is a story of something that happened to me in the middle of the night at a friend's graduation party a few years back. I don't really have any sort of explanation for what happened, but I hope deep down that I let myself get scared by some thunder. However, I know in my heart that can't be the case. So I live out in the country in rural western New York. Many of my friends live even farther out into the country than I do. One of these friends, who I'll call Eric, had his high school graduation party at his house, which was basically in the middle of nowhere. This party dragged on into the early hours of the next morning, and Eric had gotten sick of making awkward small talk with parents and teachers, so he suggested we all sneak away from the adults and go swimming in his pond. About eight of us total agreed, driving down the road a few miles to the pond he was talking about. To give you a picture of where we were, imagine a hill big enough and steep enough that it takes about five minutes to walk down. At the bottom of this hill is a small clearing with a pond and a shed. The clearing is surrounded on the other three sides by woods, and on the other side of the hill is miles of Amish country. We parked our cars next to a barn at the top of the hill, then we made our way down to the clearing. After we'd all stripped down to our underwear, we swam out to a small floating dock in the center of the pond. We spent an hour or two swimming around, trying to flip the dock and whatnot. It was a cloudy night which rendered it almost pitch black out, to the point where I could not make out the details of anyone around me. Basically, they were all just gray shapes, and if I hadn't known them by their voices, I would have never been able to tell them apart. It was at that moment that Eric decided to tell all of us about some of the massive fish they'd just stocked the pond with the week before. One of our friends has a serious phobia of swimming with fish. He began to freak out, making a mad dash for the shore, flailing, splashing, and hyperventilating loudly as he went. Each of us took turns telling Eric what a jerk he'd been as we swam after our panicking friend. We managed to calm him down, then we decided to call it a night. One by one, each of us put our clothes back on and drove home until just Eric and I were left. I couldn't find my car keys. Eric asked if everything was okay, and I didn't want to embarrass myself, so I told him I was just going to be another minute or two, as I just wanted to answer a text. I told him he could just go ahead and drive home. And he did, leaving me there at the barn. As soon as he was out of sight, I turned on my phone flashlight, making my way back down the hill to look for my keys at the spot where I'd taken off my clothes. About a minute or two into looking, there was this loud boom, like a crack of thunder, that came from deep within the woods. Figuring that thunder was all it was, I continued my search until a minute or two later, when I heard the same exact sound again. Now I need to make it clear, what I heard was not a second boom, it was the same boom repeated. The two sounds were exactly the same in every way, like a recording being played back. I kept looking until I heard the third and fourth booms. It was only at that point that I was starting to realize this wasn't thunder. All the booms were the exact same sound, and they were coming at even intervals, to the point I was able to predict when they would happen. 
I was also starting to notice they were getting louder. Like whatever was making those sounds was getting closer. Starting to get freaked out, I turned and made my way back up the hill. I was hoping my keys were somewhere near my car, and I figured in the worst case scenario, I would just wait out this thunderstorm and go back down to look afterwards. On the way up the hill, I began to notice that not only were the booms getting louder, but the amount of time between each boom was becoming uniformly smaller every time. The whole thing was weird, unnatural. I only spent a minute or two searching the ground for my keys before the booms got so loud they triggered something in me like fight or flight. I locked myself into my car, hoping to wait out the storm. At this point, there were only 30 seconds or so between each boom. They were loud enough that I was instinctually lifting my hands about halfway to my head, as if to cover my ears each time. Not knowing what else to do, and fully freaked out, aware that this could not have been thunder, I started to frantically search for my keys, praying I'd left them in my car somewhere. By then, the booms were deafening, and so close together, it was almost just a constant buzz of noise. The next boom would start before the current one was finished echoing. I couldn't even hear my own panicked thoughts as I suddenly noticed the blue fabric of my lanyard sticking out from under the seat. I grabbed the keys, jamming them into the ignition, thankful to be out of this mess. Just as I put the car into drive came the final boom. This last boom was easily twice as loud as the one before it. So loud, it felt like something was physically moving around inside my skull. The car shook, the headlights flickered out, then back on, and I could hear the windows rattling as the echoes died down. After that last boom, everything went back to normal. I sped down the country road until I was two towns away. I then slowed down to the legal speed limit, then drove home. The following day, I asked a few of the other partygoers, as well as Eric, if they'd heard those booming sounds and what they might be. But nobody had noticed any sort of booming sounds or thunder at all that night. Looking into it, I've been unable to find anything that suggests there was even a thunderstorm that night. For all I know, this experience was uniquely mine. It was just me and my car alone in the woods in the middle of the night with some loud and unnatural disembodied sounds playing on repeat. Monster Lurking in Pennsylvania River Town from Axe Enjoyer Before I start, I should say that I have an overactive imagination, but I can distinguish reality from the things in my head. I truly do believe that I encountered something. The first encounter happened when I was hanging out with a friend on the main street of that river town. We'd sat down on a dam, smoking a moderate amount of the devil's lettuce. I wasn't too faded, but it was noticeable. I was on my skateboard and this guy was on his bike. I'd met the kid not too long ago. Didn't really trust him much yet, and to be honest, I still don't. At one point, he asked if I wanted to take another road that was longer from my house, but mostly downhill. Wanting to test the riser pads I just bought, I agreed. The street was shut down for a reason I forget, but the people who lived on it had access. It was getting dark, but no one was going to be driving down for the foreseeable future, so we sparked up again. It was nothing too major. Towards the end of the long road, the other guy stopped in his tracks. The woods around us fell silent then. Being a self-proclaimed woodsman, that startled me. Hey, we should keep moving, I said. Please tell me you see that too, he replied. See what? The guy then pointed to across a clearing. There in the tree line, I swear there was this skinny white figure... Its arms were abnormally long. Its eyes were a deep gold. It was humanoid in shape, except for its oversized pelvis. I didn't panic at first. I was just observing this thing, thinking it was like a weird albino deer or something like that. 
or maybe I was just tweaking. But then I watched it shuffle onto two legs, arms dragging along the ground behind it as it walked into the woods. The hill I was walking on was too steep to ride my board, so I kept my pocket knife close and trekked onward. The rest of the way I felt an overbearing presence that brought with it a sense of dread. Although the presence itself didn't seem malevolent, it felt more neutral, like a predator simply watching another animal that it might consider prey. As soon as I got off that road, the feeling went away, and the sounds of cars coming down the road to my home relieved me. I skated home, and I tried my best to stop thinking about it. Demon in My Room From The Ghast Mask This ghost has been witnessed by several of my family members and two of my closest friends since I was a young kid. I'll explain them in the order I personally became aware of them. My grandpa purchased this duplex house on June 23, 1982. It was previously owned by a family who, according to the landlord, had a son deeply involved in the occult. I first saw the boy when I was eight years old in 2005, on the day of the Rose Parade. My sister, grandpa, and I were watching the parade on TV when a shadow moved towards my room through the connecting hallway that led to the room shared by my sister, my mom, and I. My mom wasn't home, and I assumed it was my cousin, whom I'll call A, coming down to play outside. I kept looking to see who it was, and I saw a boy dressed in brown canvas pants, a collarless white button-up shirt, and a raggedy vest walking into my room. I got up to investigate, still thinking it might be my cousin. When I entered my room and flipped on the lights, it was empty. I brushed it off then, thinking I was just seeing things. However, when I returned to the living room, my sister asked me about the kid. She described the boy's appearance exactly as I saw it, even before I said a word to her. We told my grandpa then, who looked shocked, who then told my grandma to call the pastor to bless the house. My grandma, a devout Catholic, prayed and used holy water on the room's entrance and us. A few years after that, I saw the boy again, long after the house was blessed. I was 13 then, it was June, and after a skate park visit, my two closest friends and I returned to my house to watch a movie and have some food. While I was boiling water in the kitchen, my friends asked me to turn down the non-existent AC. Apparently, they'd felt a cold breeze from the hallway. I did too, and when I looked in that direction, I saw the boy again. He was walking from my room to my grandpa's room. Having heard that ghosts and spirits could alter temperatures, I realized maybe he was making the room cold. Scared, we left the house, waiting for my grandparents to return. My grandma started praying and blessing the house again. Fast forward three years after that, I was 16. My cousin was around four years old. We were watching a movie when he started to cry, claiming he saw an ugly boy staring at both of us. I witnessed the fear on his face and heard him describe the boy's menacing actions. My grandma used holy water and prayers once again to ward off this entity. About a month later, a rocker-looking guy approached us outside our house, claiming he used to live there as a kid. He even asked to see his old room, mentioning something about a board. He had an upside-down cross and a pentagram on his jacket. Later on, we were curious about what he was talking about, and after some investigation, we discovered a Ouija board with the same symbol. I was no longer thinking the boy was a ghost. Maybe he was a demon. A pastor, along with some nuns, blessed the house, closing the supposed portal to the underworld, which may have been created by the Ouija board. My grandparents still live in that house, and neither of my cousins have seen the boy again. The experience with the Ouija board instilled a new fear, and I'll never forget it. That boy was a demon, and I only realized it when the guy came looking for his board. To both the boy and the guy, let's never meet again. 
She was in my head. From Abigail W. When I was younger, maybe 16 years old or so, I'd have these reoccurring nightmares. On nights when I did not have a nightmare, I would still wake up in a cold sweat, feeling eyes all over me. My heart would race, I'd feel pure panic, but I couldn't move, and I didn't want to move. I don't remember when these things started out, but I have to assume it was around the time I got really into Wicca and black magic. I purchased a few books from a local store, and I went in completely blind, trying everything I could, because I was so fascinated by it. Nowadays, I have a much deeper respect for these kinds of things, but I don't practice anymore in my 20s. Anyway, one night I remember clearly, I was sitting on my couch watching TV and playing video games when I heard a knock from up in my room, followed by these heavy footsteps. Again, I'm no stranger to ghosts and spirits and the occult, so I walked on over to the stairs that led to my room. I was quite confident until I rounded the corner and I saw her. Sometimes she was in a white dress, sometimes in a black one, but a few things always stayed the same. Her piercing, gaunt, haunting eyes, her hair, dark and flat, her face, twisted but smiling a sinister grin. We'd stare at each other for what felt like an eternity, but she'd never say a word, and I was always too paralyzed to even imagine speaking. Like one of those dreams where you scream and scream, but no one hears you, except I couldn't even open my mouth. Then I woke up on the couch, heart beating so fast, so hard, I honestly thought I'd die. But the worst part was hearing her laugh from upstairs. After catching my breath and calming myself down, I finally mustered up some courage to drag myself off the couch and run upstairs, demanding that she show herself and to get the heck out of my house I could hear her laugh again, but this time it was coming from my sister's room. I ran across the hall, and I did the same thing, yelling, You do not belong here! Get out! Finally, I heard her, but not in any room or anything like that. I swear I heard her voice in my head. You belong to me, Abby. You are mine. The way she said mine scared me so bad, I passed out then. The nightmares came again, but when I woke up this time, I saw my father standing over me, shaking me awake, asking what I was doing. I panicked for a moment, and I told him I had a really freaky dream. He laughed and went about his night. He had just gotten off work, so I really didn't want to bother him with my story but my nightmares came back for many nights. So if my dad wasn't home, I wouldn't be either. I tried to never stay in that house alone. We moved some years later, and I haven't had those dreams or seen her since. But she still haunts my memories. I've been by that house since, though, and every time I walk or drive by, I get that familiar feeling of eyes all over me. I know she's there and she wants me to come home. Bulgarian Samodiva From Abuse to Deuce This is a story that's been told to me by my grandmother countless times. I finally decided to record it and transcribe it, so as to share it here, and also keep it as a cherished memory for the future. To give you some context, we're in Bulgaria. In the early 1900s, my grandmother wasn't yet born, and what she knows about this story was told to her by her grandfather, who was still quite young at the time of the events. I would add I was also born in Bulgaria, but at an early age I moved to Italy, and I remember little to nothing of the Bulgarian language. Anyway, I'll share this story the way my grandmother told me, from her perspective. One night many years ago, even before I was born, a man was at home on a cold winter evening. 
since his home did not have an indoor toilet, he had to go outside to use the restroom. He didn't even bother to dress properly, wearing only his woolen socks on his feet. So, shortly after 11 o'clock in the evening, he ventured out of bed and approached the door. As soon as he crossed the threshold of his home, he heard a dulcet melody and noticed dancing figures, all dressed in white, men and women. These mysterious figures, called Samodivas, noticed him, and two girls approached. They grabbed him by the arms and said, Come with us, we're celebrating a wedding. The man, astonished, asked who they really were, and the girls replied, We are Samodivas. We are celebrating the union of our sister. Now that you've seen us, you must come with us. In a state of enchantment, the man felt compelled to go with them. For it was said that once a Samodiva called you, you could not oppose nor refuse their invitation. He felt as though he was in a dream, devoid of will, unable to object, as if he had lost his own voice. So with the Samodiva, he began a long pilgrimage across the country, dancing, celebrating, until he reached Klisera. Along their way, they came to an artificial dam and an open well. Here, the Samodiva wondered what to do with the man, whether to throw him into the well or something else, since he was now so far from home and trapped in their dream world. One of the girls offered the man some wine, but at that moment, a rooster crowed. It was dawn, and the Samodiva immediately disappeared. The man found himself near the well, slowly beginning to wake up from his enchanted state. With the coming of day and thus of light, he lowered his eyes to look at the jug of wine that had been offered to him. He realized, instead, that he had his hands in the severed head of a foal and a white wedding handkerchief. Bewildered and frightened, he decided to take this bizarre evidence of his experience with him to share with the locals. Still wearing his woolen stockings, he began the return journey through the cold and snow. The villagers watched in amazement, wondering where he could have been and what had happened to him. The man divulged his extraordinary story to them. As days passed, the man lost his mind, but he lived for years before he met his end. Some speculated that he had lost his mind even before that event, thus raising the question, where did he find the foal's head during that strange night? Cat Spirit in My Room From Light Breaks Through I've always been one of those people that doesn't believe something until I see it or experience it for myself. I'm not one to believe in the paranormal, until this happened. It started not long ago when some friends came over for a visit. I was clearing up my desk so I could do some homework on it. I put a mask, a Bible, wood, a ball, and a couple of other coloring things on my shelves. I left my room after I was finished clearing the desk. I talked with my brother, and then I suddenly heard something fall from my room. I went to investigate, and I found my Bible on my floor, the one I just put up. Now, before you say it just fell on its own, it had been placed in a way it couldn't fall like that. I picked it up, and I went to put it back on my shelf, when I suddenly heard the hiss of a cat coming from under my bed. Now, we do have two cats, but they were outside at the time, because we live in the country. I jumped back about five feet, Bible in hand. I only knew one thing to do at that moment, so I prayed. I'm a Christian. When I finished my prayer, I felt something on my leg then. Something furry. When I looked down, I caught a glimpse of a tail-like thing from the corner of my eye, but when I tried to look at it then, it was gone. My Bible was still in my hands as I held it tightly to my chest. I placed it back on the shelf quickly, and I booked it out of my room. Later that day, I forgot all about the experience until I went back in my room. My Bible, somehow, was back on the ground, 
As soon as I saw it, I remembered the tail and the hiss. I prayed to God again to protect me, and I repeated this one verse, which said, When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Those exact words made me feel safe. I didn't see my own cat come in my room. She scared the crap out of me when she meowed at me suddenly. I let her on my bed then, when I noticed she was staring at my shelves. My cat arched her back and began to hiss at the shelves. I was scared out of my mind at that point, but I still didn't leave the room yet. Then my cat stopped. She curled up near my legs as if nothing happened. A couple of hours after that, my mom called me over for dinner. I finished dinner and declined my mom's request for dessert, and I headed back to my room. I threw myself onto the bed and stared at the ceiling. At around 9.30, my mom told me to go to bed, so I did. I was about to fall asleep when I felt fur on my leg. Now, at that time, our cats were outside. I looked at my leg, and I saw nothing there. The feeling of fur left me, and I sat there dumbfounded. I then felt the need to go to the bathroom, and right when I got up to do so, I heard hissing again. I immediately jerked my legs up onto my bed. I was starting to feel bad for whatever was there, and I said to whatever was in my room, I'm nice. I don't want to hurt you. I don't know you, but I know you're here. I don't think you know you're no longer flesh and blood. I'm kind, and I don't want to bother you. But you should know, this is my room. So please, leave me alone. The hissing stopped but so did every other sound. I quickly got up and ran to the bathroom to relieve myself. I was lucky that the bathroom was right next to my room. That's the end of my story. I don't know what happened to that cat spirit, but I never saw nor heard it again. I hope it's resting in peace. Curse of the Morris Minor From Am Jean Romeo Back in July of 2018, my step-grandma on my dad's side was involved in a car accident, which resulted in her being thrown through the side window of her husband's Morris Minor, down a hill, through a row of barbed wire, finally landing in a patch of mud. Obviously, she sustained serious injuries and was rushed to the nearest hospital. She had been driving down a country road in the small village of Lonmay, Scotland, where she lived with her husband. My granddad has offered to drive her, but she declined that time, proceeding on her way to go and pick up her daughter, who lived in the next village over. How she got into that accident is not exactly known, but the stretch of road she was driving down had a history of being dangerous for cars. We also don't believe she was wearing a seatbelt, as being an old car, it likely didn't have any. Despite the quick action of the emergency services, and the dedicated care of the doctors and surgeons. She passed away in the hospital a few days later. They tried to wake her up, but she was unresponsive. My granddad was shattered. I remember my dad telling me, not long after this, that my granddad lost his faith in God then. Despite his prayers for the survival of his wife, he believed God had abandoned him, letting his beloved wife die. Adding to our sadness was the fact that my dad, my three siblings, and myself had been planning to go and visit my grandparents, which we'd scheduled for only a couple of weeks after the accident happened. We'd recently regained contact with my granddad and his family, so this was a bitter blow to all of us. Since then, my dad has kept in regular contact with his father in the form of weekly phone calls. This leads me to the story my dad relayed to me a few weeks back. He had been chatting with his dad on the phone one Sunday afternoon, when my granddad brought up the topic of the accident. Knowing the sadness my granddad still felt, five years later, my dad tried to steer the conversation to another topic. My granddad went quiet for a moment, before he proceeded to tell his son about how the Morris Minor car, now scrap metal, had come into his possession. He could not quite remember the exact date he bought that car. 
Nevertheless, he went on to describe the interaction he had with the previous owner, or should I say, the previous owner's wife. He had driven up to the property of the owner of the Morris Minor. Upon arriving, the owner of the car was nowhere in sight. However, my granddad was soon approached by a woman. My granddad described her as a witch of a woman. She was elderly. On the larger side, she walked with a cane, and when she saw my granddad get out of his car, she slowly approached. Her walking cane thudded on the tarmac drive. What do you want? She asked. Her voice was high, but it had a gravelly quality to it, likely due to the strong smell of cigarette smoke that wafted from her. My granddad then explained to her that he was there to look at the Morris Minor for sale. He knew the owner and had been excited when he heard the car was for sale. He loved old cars. The woman's eyes opened wide, and she screamed at him. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. It's cursed. That darned car is cursed, I tell you. My granddad stared at the old woman in shock. He let out a nervous laugh. What do you mean? How can a car be cursed? The woman glared at him and shuffled closer, until she was close enough she could wag a finger directly in front of his face. The last three owners of this car have all died. All of them. This thing is cursed. Don't buy it, unless you want the same thing to happen to you. The woman looked crazed, and my granddad just continued to stare at her. Moments later, another car pulled up. The owner of the car. My granddad was relieved to get away from the woman and headed over to greet the man. He and my granddad exchanged pleasantries, and soon my granddad was given a tour of the car. All the while, the old woman watched on, muttering to herself. My granddad, though a Christian, was not at all superstitious, and soon pushed the woman's comments to the back of his mind. He left that day, with the Morris Minor hooked up to the back of his own car. He was beyond ecstatic with his purchase, and he paid the comments of the woman no mind as he drove away. I was out for lunch with my dad when he told me this story. My mouth dropped open upon hearing what the woman had said. It left me feeling extremely creeped out. Even my own dad, who's a very logical man, was creeped out. He said that even he would have walked away from the car that day after hearing the comments from the old woman. The day of the accident, my granddad had offered to drive his wife. I can't help but think that maybe he was meant to be in that car that day and would have left his wife a distraught widow. How he went ahead and still bought that car despite the warning, I don't know. Even if the previous owners had died due to illness or other reasons, how could he not find it strange that every person who had owned that car had died? I imagine he lives with the guilt every day. The only solace was that he heard his wife's voice when looking down at her coffin at the funeral, letting him know she was okay. I'd like to hope that hearing her voice restored a little bit of belief back in him. Bob the Shadow from Tiff H. I've always been aware of strange things since I was quite young. This experience is one of many unexplainable occurrences I've had, and it is the one that frightened me the most. I was a young 8th grade girl who just moved to the north from the south a couple of years prior. I had a hard time fitting in and making friends. I suffered from social anxiety throughout the majority of my youth and through my 20s, and I found it difficult to get to know children in my age group. I finally managed to eke out somewhat of a social life by the time 8th grade rolled around. I found myself in a group of 6 or 7 girls in my class. I still had major anxiety and constant issues at school with bullying, but at least I had a few girls to get to spend time with on the weekends. My best friend at the time, Kat, would frequently host sleepovers at her parents' house, and we would watch TV in her finished basement, 
We'd also play games and call boys, etc. One particular weekend, Kat's mother took her shopping and bought a glow-in-the-dark Ouija board. Kat told me she wanted to host another sleepover and invited me and two other friends to spend the night. That board was brought out as soon as all the guests had arrived. Most of us were eager to play, treating it fairly lightly. However, I remember my dad had warned me when I was young never to involve myself with a spirit board. He had an experience as a boy, and although he did not go into detail, my dad is definitely someone I consider a reliable source for honesty and truth. I heard in my head, don't you put your hand on that planchette. Then I asked myself, what the heck is a planchette? Ignoring this intrusive thought, I joined my friends in playing the game. In the beginning, we played and joked around, moving the planchette ourselves, spelling out silly answers. But before long, things got serious. The atmosphere suddenly changed from warm and happy to anxious and scary. We started getting serious and asking questions. The first question was, What is your name? And we received this response, B. O. B. We all kind of giggled, thinking one of us must be moving the piece around on our own. So we quieted ourselves to ask more questions, and we got a couple of responses. Now, I can't remember the questions we asked after seeing his name spelled out, but I do remember one of our friends telling us she was done playing. She seemed scared. Not wanting to alienate someone, we all complied. We said goodbye and we put the board away. We all went to sleep that night without a care in the world. A couple of weekends had passed since playing the game, and Kat asked if I wanted to come over after school and mess with the Ouija board. I was definitely curious, and her excitement only made it more tantalizing. So we walked to her house after school. She pulled out the board in the basement. We sat down and both touched the planchette. We asked to whom we were speaking, and its reply was, B. O. B. I then decided to ask a silly question. At the time, I was dating a boy. Now, this was not in the age of cell phones, so he agreed to call Kat's house sometime in the evening to speak with me. I asked, Bob, when is my boyfriend going to call? Bob responded, Seven. Minutes. Kat and I both looked at her digital clock and noted the time. I can't quite remember how we filled that seven-minute gap, but we were very anxious to see if he would actually call in that time frame. Feeling like an eternity had passed, seven minutes was up on the clock when, ring, ring. We exploded in a thunderbolt of emotions. Both of us screamed our guts out with excitement, anxiety, and fear overhearing her phone ring in exactly seven minutes. My heart raced, a tingle in the back of my skull, and my anticipation of wondering who was on the line had me answering her phone after three or four rings. I picked up the phone, trying to hide my excitement and panic. Hello? The voice on the other end was my boyfriend. I screamed like a little girl, all giddy and surprised, telling him I'd have to call him back. Kat and I sat there in shock for a few moments, trying to absorb what just happened. In my head, I was absolutely mortified. I was out of my mind with fear. Kat must have had the same line of thought, because she wanted to put the board away, and I wholeheartedly agreed. We said goodbye, and never touched that board or another again. Now, at one point, my parents had rented this beautiful two-story farmhouse, it was set back in a clearing, surrounded by trees. The place felt like an oasis, because just beyond those trees, we were surrounded by apartments and neighborhoods, right off a freeway exit. Turning down our long, gravel driveway, you're overwhelmed with a sense of privacy, or isolation, depending on your frame of thought. I tend to enjoy my peace, being an only child to parents who aren't very social. I loved spending time by myself, this house was perfect for us. The entire second floor was mine, and although I've always been afraid to sleep by myself, I still enjoyed the privacy. 
soon after my last time playing with a spirit board. This place would turn into a nightmare that would last for months, culminating in an experience that would traumatize me for a solid decade. The torment started very simply, as it usually does. My bedroom was up a flight of stairs that turned into a hallway. The room I chose to sleep in was the first room off the stairs, and I always had a nightlight on in the hallway so I could see in the night. I started seeing a shadow beside my light switch, right in the hallway. It didn't move the first couple of weeks I noticed it. It just looked like a blob. A person-sized blob. I reacted fairly calmly, because this type of crap happens all the time. You'd have to know my life to understand. It wasn't moving, not harming me, and my rational side told me it was my eyes playing tricks or me being paranoid. I didn't tell anyone about it, because it wasn't something I could prove, and my parents were already sick of hearing things like this. At one point, Cat came to spend the night. I hadn't talked about the shadow until I saw it that night. It had become a part of my routine to stare at this thing before falling asleep. But I had to see if I was going crazy. I asked Cat, Do you see something by my light switch? She replied, Is that Bob? We both stared in what seemed like a void, staring into that darkness. But then we both saw it move. We screamed, the two of us hiding under my blankets. When we eventually resurfaced, we saw nothing, but we didn't sleep that night. I felt sick to my stomach, absolutely nauseated with the thought that someone had witnessed it as well. I was hoping this was in my head, that she would confirm the idea, but I just grew more terrified. After this experience, it grew worse. It was as if our fear gave it power. I would lie in bed in the coming nights, and instead of staying by my light switch, the shadow spread out. I watched it spread itself to every corner of my room, suspended up near my ceilings. I watched in paralyzed terror as the shadows from the corners formed into a solid black mass right above my face. I felt smothered, like there was something physically placed above me, like I was in a coffin. Where there was moonlight and artificial lighting coming from the hallway was now nothing but pure darkness. I felt blind, claustrophobic, and all I could do was hyperventilate until I passed out from fear. Can you believe it got worse than that? After the nights of seeing this black mass above me, I started to wake up frequently in the night. It would start out as whispered conversations above my head. I would wake up, hearing a group of voices, not able to pick out even one word of conversation. As soon as I opened my eyes, it would stop. I confess I'm quite used to waking up like this, and I thought this was common for everyone. The whispering did not bother me as much as it should have, so I think they, or it, turned it up a notch. After a few nights of the shadow, whispered conversations, and feeling as though all eyes were on me, I started waking up feeling as if I had just landed on my own bed, as if someone had lifted me up in the air and just dropped me back down onto my mattress. Again, I'm used to this feeling and would usually fall right back to sleep. Until one night, I awoke with my name being yelled right by my ear. Someone was desperate to get my attention, and I was having none of it. My eyes stayed glued shut. No way, man. Emotionally, I drew the line. No more sleeping upstairs by myself again. I wasn't getting sleep because of the constant badgering during the night, waking up sweating, getting spiritually weak, feeling isolated. I told myself I would sleep in the living room from now on until this thing got frustrated and left me alone. I gathered my blankets and pillows and made myself comfortable on the living room couch. I felt pretty good falling asleep there, like I'd avoided the plague that was happening upstairs. I remember falling asleep pretty easily, ready for a good night of rest. I suddenly awoke in the middle of the night, coughing, choking. I lifted myself onto my elbows. I tried to get my breath back. It felt as if someone had squeezed my throat to the point I choked. I caught my breath. 
I was on my elbows, steadying my breathing. The kitchen light turned on. From where I was lying, I could see into the kitchen dining room. The light switch for both was in my line of sight. Still disoriented, I thought it was my mom coming to check on me. Mom? I called out. Mom? As I turned to look, I saw an empty kitchen. But after a few moments, as I stared, a black mass began to come up from the kitchen floor. It looked like more than a shadow. No light penetrating it. No discernible features. It was solid black. I saw it rise up, and as it did, a shape formed. I could tell it had four limbs. It stood upright. It was wearing a robe. I could tell that it was wearing a hood and had sleeves, but no hands. There was no face, no eyes, just darkness. I stared at it, paralyzed again with fear, still up on my elbows, lying on that couch. The figure was about six feet tall, and although it had no face, it felt as if this thing was staring me down. I watched in horror as it started to glide, not walk, towards me. Slowly it glided, fear making bile rise in my throat. I could not release a sound. My only thought was that my life was over, and this creature was going to drag me to hell. In that moment, all my fears were in front of me, and all I could do was pray. Please don't let this thing take me. Please don't let this thing take me. I repeated over and over as it came closer. It finally reached the end of the couch, a few inches away from my feet. I thought, this is it. Before it touched my feet, it dipped down into the floor and disappeared. Finally, after a few moments, I was able to scream for my mother, who came running out to see why I was so terrified. Mind you, my mother does not believe in the supernatural. She's always tried to cast doubt on any experience on the subject. She's been through night terrors, sleepwalking, talking in my sleep, and me being afraid of every house we've ever lived in. She was sick of it, so she did what any good parent would do, totally dismiss my experience. She said, it was just a nightmare. I looked at her and asked, then how is the kitchen light on? She didn't have an answer. Since that experience, I've never seen a shadow person again. I've witnessed things that I won't forget, and I'm currently trying to put my experiences in a short novel. I won't publish it. It isn't important for me to let everyone know, but it helps me put everything into perspective. The whistling, the whispering, the orbs, clothes flying at you from a closet, hearing your name being called when no one's around, having dreams of dead relatives in a white place. Those experiences, though, aren't crap compared to the one I've just shared with you. It changed me forever, and it was a clear warning to stop messing around with the other side before I truly find out what could happen. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs, Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.